Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Wednesday, October 4th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please forgive me, got a really sore throat today. <clears> throat> trying to get over that. Um, a lot of talk about this Las Vegas shooter. <sighs> a lot of unclear details, a lot of things happening in this world. It, it seems that we're being deceived on all sides. There's liars and deceivers out there all over the place, many of them in government positions. You know, the Bible told us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spirits and principalities and powers in high places. There's a lot of things going on today that we don't recognize, we don't realize, but let's have a look at some things going on in Israel. There's a lot going on there as well. Of course, understand something. Israel sent people to Hurricane Harvey to help out there. They sent people where Hurricane Irma hit. They sent people down to Mexico for the earthquake. And Israel stands beside America during this tragedy of this Las Vegas shooting. I wish more people would understand that. And I'm hearing people left and right talking about, oh, stop the guns, end guns, and we won't have violence. It's funny, this, this shooter was a registered Democrat. You don't hear that a lot in the news. You know, and you hear his brother say he had no political affiliation. Well, more and more is coming out. You know, his Facebook page was lined with anti-Trump protests, pictures of him at anti-Trump rallies, even with the, the pink hat and all that stuff. So there's a lot more to it than we're being told, obviously how some guy his age was able to drag some 400 pounds of ammo and equipment up 32 stories and go unnoticed. And removing the window, those windows don't just open. I've been in that hotel. Those windows don't open. You have to do something to remove it. I don't know. A lot of questions. Anyway, out of the Times of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu says... Faux Palestinian reconciliation risks our existence. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected ongoing reconciliation efforts between the Palestinian Authority and the Gaza-based Hamas terror group, saying any future Palestinian government must disband the terror organization's armed wing and sever all ties with Iran. He said, we expect anyone talking about a peace process to recognize Israel and, of course, recognize a Jewish state and we won't accept faux reconciliations in which the Palestinian side reconciles at the expense of our existence. Saying, yeah, this reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, it's all fake. Well, we're now learning. They're not reconciling because they can't get along. They can't even agree amongst themselves. And yet the world wants Israel to have a lifelong peace agreement with these people. Even Mahmoud Abbas ad admits... Out of international or Israel National News, Abbas admits no Palestinian state in the near future. He said, yeah, Palestinian state is not in the upcoming future. It's, it's not going to happen. It, it can't happen. He said, maybe the time will come for a Palestinian state, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, if you're not willing to negotiate, then yeah, you're right. It won't happen. You know, negotiate means giving up some of the things you want. Just so you know, I mean, it appears that you don't understand that, Mr. Abbas, because you've laid down the law saying, here's all the things we want and anything less than this, and we're not going to agree to anything. Well, that's not negotiating. That's demanding. Um, sorry, there's a big, huge difference. Out of the Times of Israel, amid reconciliation talk, Netanyahu and Abbas are in rare harmony on Hamas. They're in rare harmony on, on Hamas. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu came out forcefully against the current round of Palestinian unity talks between rival factions Hamas and Fatah, um, holding this meeting, trying to reconcile. He said, you know, you have to dismantle Hamas's military wing. You have to sever relationships with Iran, which calls for our destruction. Mahmoud Abbas agrees with him. 
Abbas demanded the Palestinian Authority control the border and the ministries and securing in Gaza security. He said he would not allow Hamas to keep its military wing. He said, I won't accept the reproduction of the Hezbollah experience in Lebanon in Gaza. He said, dismantle Hamas's military wing. Wow. Wow. Maybe, maybe there is a chance they can agree. Maybe they can reach an agreement. Who knows? Mahmoud Abbas, out of the Times of Israel, vows not to let Hamas keep armed forces in Gaza. He said he won't let them keep their armed forces in Gaza. I'm not going to allow Gaza to become Lebanon like Hezbollah has done there. Out of Israel National News, Netanyahu uses Temple Institute Sukkah. Very interesting. I've been to the Temple Institute. It's amazing the things they have there. Um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will use a sukkah brought from the Temple Institute, printed with original artwork depicting the Holy Temple. Temple Institute co-founder and international director Rabbi Kaim Rickman said 30 years ago, before we established the Temple Institute, few people knew what the Holy Temples looked like. After decades of painstaking research and educational activities, including the commissioning of original and exact artwork, the vision of the third holy temple is closer than ever. Hmm. Yeah. Christians aren't the only ones hoping for this third Jewish temple. It's coming. It's coming. <clears throat> Here's a story out of Fox News. It says Las Vegas shooter installed cameras in and out of his hotel room ahead of premeditated attack. He had a camera set up on his the little peephole in his door so he would know if somebody was trying to get in. He had a camera set up on a, a service cart outside his door so he could see if people were coming down the hallway. At least that's what this story says. Um, he said obviously his acts were premeditated. Some of the things he did are a little troublesome, setting up these cameras. Um, the footage wasn't being transmitted anywhere outside the hotel, probably going directly to his phone or somewhere where he could watch. But the amount of firepower this man had in one room, I mean, he could take on a small army with what he had going on. Again, I'm sure more information will become known in the few days coming, but... Will we really find out the truth, or will we just hear what they want us to hear? Um, seems the rhetoric is continuing, uh, the calls for doing away with guns, you know, kind of like the war on drugs was so successful in making everyone stop using drugs. Um, everyone calling for gun control. Democrats, Hillary Clinton... Celebrities left and right. Disarm the public. There will be no more killing. Look at Chicago, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Los Angeles, and all kinds of other places that have some of the most restrictive gun laws in America. And they're among some of the highest gun-related fatalities. You see, it's not guns that kill people. It's the people using them that kill people. It's a heart problem people. It's not a gun problem. And then there's incitement. All these celebrities and politicians on the far left, they're pounding the airwaves with their aggressive comments calling for all kinds of gun control. They're very sarcastic. They're very mean-spirited and demeaning to anyone who disagrees with anything of their beliefs. Um, same kind of thing we've been hearing ever since Donald Trump became president. You know, anyone who disagrees with him is given some sort of label from racist to bigot to misogynist to idiot to redneck to whatever. And this rhetoric is being just pounded 24-7 on news shows, talk shows, social media, websites, emails, all forms of communication. Who knows what the next big thing's going to be? Or how long before it gets here? I mean, my goodness, September was pretty rough. Um, all these hurricanes, earthquakes, mass shootings. 
Uh, I mean, how many words from Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders and Nancy Pelosi and Kathy Griffin and all these others, this, this hatred that's just filling up, boiling over, this incitement. It's amazing. Most of the ones I see spewing hatred on TV or on the news are most definitely godless people. We know most of the celebrities who know God, right? I mean, because they, they tell us about, you know, Denzel Washington and some of these people that stand up and take a stand for Christ. So many more of them that don't, though. And not that we should be hating on them, but we should be praying for them. Praying that the truth of Jesus Christ will open their blind eyes. Praying that the Prince of Peace will help them with their racism and their hatred. The incitement has to stop. People have to tone down this hateful speech. George Washington said in his 1796 farewell speech, he warned against divisions. Here's what George Washington said in his 1796 farewell speech. He said, the name of America, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations. With slight shades of difference, you have the same religion, same manners, habits, and political principles. We should act as such. Jesus said in Mark 3, 25, And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. There are ways to disagree without being disagreeable. As Christians, he said, we know how Christ taught civility and solving our differences without hate or vulgarity. For the sake of our way of life and our eternal hope, let us first be an example of Christ in our discussions and also call on everyone to tone down the rhetoric in this atmosphere of hate. George Washington 1796 farewell speech. Hmm. His words ring true even today. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah 4, verse 15, it says, And it came to pass, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one of us to his work. When the enemies heard that God frustrated their plan, they returned each to their work. You know, God can do amazing things with people who refuse to quit, who never back down, who don't take their eyes off the present circumstances. They look ahead because they believe God has something great in store for them. Hope. See, that's what Nehemiah did. He was faced with a crisis when he was building this wall in Jerusalem. The enemies of God had tried everything they could to stop their work, but God brought their plot to nothing. Nehemiah looked ahead, looked forward to his goal, and he sent everyone back to work. All right, get back to the wall, let's go. Nehemiah focused on the future. He refused to be discouraged by the present circumstances because he knew God was going to do something great. You know, Paul even gives us the same encouragement. In Philippians 3, uh, about verses 13 and 14, it says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies ahead and straining forward to what lies ahead, or forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, if you're discouraged about what you see going on, see what you see happening around you, Think about this. You know, God may just be letting you go through a downtime to prepare you for a great victory tomorrow. You know, you do have to go through the valley before you can reach the peak, the top of the mountain. So don't, don't hang your head down low. Lift up your eyes. Look forward. Look up. <coughs> because God's blessings are probably just right around the corner.
There is no condemnation in Christ. In Mark 16, whew, <clears throat> Mark 16, starting in verse 5. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he said unto them, Be not affrightened. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they lay him. Behold the place where they lay him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. As he said unto you. I think Peter was pretty devastated when he realized he denied Christ not once but three times just like Jesus told him in Luke 22 verse 61 and 62 this was the man who just a few hours earlier had bravely vowed to die for the Lord in Luke 22 verse 33 I'm pretty sure Peter most of his life probably never forgot the feeling of that failure I'm sure he spent the next few days just suffocating under this burden of guilt. You know, I think most of us know exactly how heavy that burden feels. I mean, the weight of our sin goes with us everywhere, sometimes dragging us down into a pit of despair. Sometimes it seems like in those moments that God kind of piles more stuff on us in that time, you know, like we're rejected, like we're not even loved, which isn't true. You feel condemned somehow. But all who trust in Jesus Christ and his atoning death on their behalf, this feeling of condemnation is exactly that. It's a feeling. It's not the truth. It's not real. It's fake news. <laughs> Believers are not condemned for their iniquity. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Condemnation is reserved for the unbeliever. Those on the left of Christ. Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 25, um, in the latter part of the chapter, about the sheep and the goats that he separates. In Matthew 25, verse 33, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And those on his left, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal, verse 46 of Matthew 25. Isn't it interesting, all the left-leaning liberals and the right-leaning conservatives these days, left and right, left and right. You know, God knew this was going to happen. God knows the end from the beginning. He's God. He knows everything. He knew exactly where this was going to go. And in fact, it's amazing that in his word, some 2,500 years ago or more, he mentions this. In Ecclesiastes 10, verse 2, it's kind of hard not to Catch this truth. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 2, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Word of God, people. That's God's word. Wise man's heart is at his right hand. It's funny how man likes to put people in a category, put them in a box, give everyone a label. Oh, you're a right-leaning conservative Christian, aren't you? Well, I guess I could fit that bill, sure. But I'm more than that. I'm a safe sinner. 
I'm a son. I'm a joint heir with Christ. Hmm. I'm a conquering, victorious believer. You want to label me? Make sure you get all the labels right. You know, we might judge ourselves harshly because of our actions, and many times our motives fall short, and our our attempt to try to be more like Christ falls horribly short, and we fail God every day. But when God looks at the Christian, he only sees the righteousness of Christ on us. We, with, we were clothed in his righteousness the moment we said yes to the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf on the cross. I mean, no one can do good enough to <clears throat> inherit the kingdom of God. No one can live righteously enough to provide their own salvation. Jesus alone removes the believer's sin and guilt. Jesus alone can give you everlasting life. God knows our burdens. He knows our sins. That's why the Lord sent Peter a message. The disciple needed to know that Jesus had risen, conquering sin and death, and was waiting in Galilee. Right there in Mark 16, verse 7, God's hope is for all believers to understand that there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So, let them call you names. Let them mock you. Let them label you wrongly. <clears throat> let them falsely accuse you. God knows who you are. God knows what you believe. And we know that Jesus paid the price. Jesus said in Mark 10, verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus <clears throat> told his disciples several times about his death. But this was one of the first times that he told them the reason for his death, a ransom for many, paying a price. You know, ransom and redeem were used interchangeably in scriptures. Not only would Jesus pay the price for sin, but also his death would be a substitutionary death. He would die in place of us. He died the death that we deserve for our sin. In 1 Timothy 2, 6, the word ransom is taken from the Greek word entulotron, which means a redemptive price. You know, the Greek word anti means in place of. So the ransom is available for all who will accept it. John three sixteen, Romans 10, verse 13. You know, the price that was paid for our redemption is the life of Jesus, the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, verse 14. This redemption, according to Hebrews 9, verse 12, is eternal. And it's intended to, impur to purify us from all iniquity. Titus 2, verse 14. And to bring us to serve the living God. Hebrews 9, verse 14. Who remembers S&H green stamps? Wow, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? That was like the mid-70s. Um... Or trading stamps of any kind. But I remember those booklets of S&H green stamps. You know, you get these booklets, and they would see these sheets of stamps and be all excited, thinking, oh, what are we going to get with all these? And you know, lick the whole thing, plaster it into the book. Then you go to the little trading place, and you, look, I've got four books of stamps. What can I get? Oh, all the stuff with four books is over here on this shelf. And you trade it in these booklets of stamps for toasters or ovens or whatever was available in those days. Uh, blenders, maybe. Um, but you see, first the stamps had to be purchased. And then they were redeemed for the product you wanted. I mean, the purchase was important, but so was the redemption. I mean, nobody really wanted the stamps. They wanted what the stamps could be redeemed for. You know, the purchase for our complete and total salvation has already been made with the blood of Jesus. But our bodies have not yet been redeemed. We've not yet received all the benefits of this transaction in our physical bodies. This will take place at the second coming of Christ when we see him as he is and we're just like him.
and we receive our new glorified bodies. Our spirits are the only part of us that have experienced this total redemption. The flesh has not yet done this. We need to thank God for his infinite wisdom, for his incredible mercy, for his loving grace, for his forgiveness, and for providing a way for us to be redeemed so that we may have everlasting life with God the Father. You know, God offers this choice to everyone on planet Earth. Everlasting life or eternal condemnation. I mean, right there at the last verse of Matthew 25, the very last verse says, and this is Jesus talking, he says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Why would anyone knowingly choose everlasting punishment? That sounds horrible. Life eternal sounds so much better. Knowing this, please <clears throat> choose wisely. Choose life. Choose Christ. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. Choose life. Choose Christ. It's the only way to God the Father. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.